Welcome everyone. Um, we see the, um, the numbers going up in the uh, guest arena and we're um, close to that RSVP list, but we'll probably have a couple more folks arriving as I kind of uh, introduce our talk for today. Um, again, welcome. My name is Anna Truxas. I'm the executive director of the Portland Chinatown Museum. Thank you for joining us today for our penultimate uh, artist talk with Chisau Hata. Uh, before we get started, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. The Portland Chinatown Museum acknowledges and honors the indigenous peoples and their descendants of the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region, whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlemet, Malala, Multnomah, and Motlala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who today are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and the many other Chinookan peoples who established communities along the Lower Columbia, whose descendants are today members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs, and Siletz Confederated Tribes of Oregon. <clears throat> So today's presentation is the fourth and final program in our summer artist talk series made possible in part by a generous grant from Neighbors West Northwest and the City of Portland Office of Community and Civic Life. We are so happy and honored to have Chisau Hata with us today. She is a community organizer and global citizen artist. She is also an Oregon Humanities Conversation Leader, Vanport Mosaic Stories and Movement Co-Director and organizing artist for Change at Dance Exchange in Tacoma Park, Maryland. Chisau is also the current creative director of Living Arts at the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. For over two decades through her work in education, she has been a protector of imagination, personal discovery, and a champion for individual expression. Creating and engaging, creating engaged, learning for our youth, our citizen artists, is her life's work. As an artist educator, dance director, arts integration specialist, community activist, and performing artist, she has had the honor of serving hundreds of Portland's children, youth, and adults across many communities. Her work has yielded generations who have an appreciation for the arts as creative problem solvers and passionate, engaged people. And just to emphasize, as a society, we all benefit from creative problem solvers and passionate, engaged people. And I have to say from working with Chisau in our community, uh, we are very grateful uh, to have her leadership in this arena to help form those future creative problem solvers and passionate, engaged people, as well as to um, collaborate with, with all of us who are engaged in this community work. We look forward to hearing from Chisau on how exposure to the arts and arts education is a mandatory requirement at any age, any profession or any position we have in life and how they help root us in our humanity and teach us to understand ourselves, our relationships and the world we live in. Welcome Chisau, we're so pleased to have you here. Hi, <laughs> thank you Anna and Kapoalani and Portland Chinatown Museum for having me today. I'm so um, thrilled to be here. And um, also um, thank you for uplifting Asian American artists in Portland uh, and throughout the state, uh, because I think through artists and their contributions, it helps make Portland a better place. Uh, and I'm so honored to be part of this, of the Portland Chinatown Museum. So I'm gonna ask people to be somewhat involved today in this, in this talk. There won't be any tests at the end or anything, but you might wanna take out a piece of paper or a journal and write down. I'm gonna ask a few inquiry questions. It might spur you on to some personal thoughts and reflections. Um, if not now, maybe you know later on in the week or in the month or in the year. Um, so I'm gonna to just touch on a little bit of my personal of uh, my experience in working in education and in community, and also my um, involvement with history. And so um, it kind of all started at the uh, Des Moines Art Center is one of the places, but in Des Moines, Iowa, where I was born. And um, 
it's actually a direct result of my mother and father being um, in the concentration camps during World War II. They were married in Poston, Arizona, and eventually were relocated to Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I don't really understand, or I'm still learning about all the complexities of the event itself, the Executive Order 9066 and its impact on Japanese American history, personally um, and globally. And, um, but that would take a long time to talk about. And so, just so you know, I, I really, in the beginning, um, in the early years, hated the fact that I was in, in Iowa and that I was born in Iowa. I didn't have any family around, no real community around. Um, I was an only child as well, so that might have uh, exacerbated the whole situation. But um, I ended up over the years appreciating the fact of the um, arts education that I received while I was in Iowa. And so I just like to ask you to reflect on one question uh, and I'll have a few throughout throughout um, the talk. I didn't say all of them. Let me let me back up a minute. So I'm going to cover like maybe five questions. So what are your earliest memories? What are your earliest memories of art, creativity, and personal and or personal expression? And how did you learn how to express yourself in school? And how can history, maybe your history and others, be taught through storytelling and the performing arts? And how can the arts build community? And how have historical events, like I just mentioned in my life, the executive order 9066 had on my life, how have historical events shaped and affected your life? So the first question was, what were your earliest memories of art, creativity, and personal expression? Uh, so at a very early age, I played. I played a lot. And I used to dress up and play, play role playing and make mud pies, play in the dirt. I'd make houses out of leaves. Um, and I used to play with these little dolls and my mother had made clothes, a full wardrobe for all of them. It was actually incredible how tiny they were. Um, but when I was four years old, I was in preschool and the teacher had put out all of this paper on the tables and then proceeded to pour out paint and let us just finger paint and put our fingers in that paint. And I still to this day can remember the feeling um, the smell, mixing the colors, the paints um, was quite a um, at four to have that memory. And so um, I actually have so many memories that have shaped this journey as an artist and an activist. Um, but one time that stands out was when I was in the seventh grade and I wasn't that great in school academically, but my English teacher said she thought that I should, do something for the school talent show. And, you know, when you're in middle school, you don't want to be out front. But I decided that that was a bit of a challenge. And I created my first solo work to the piece of music by the Beatles called Eleanor Rigby. And, um, you know, I think it gave me an opportunity to bring out some skills that I had acquired because I had studied from second grade um, at the Drake University Children's Theater Program. So I'd go to grade school and walk across the street and go over to Drake University. And there I had an amazing teacher whose name was Portia Boynton. Yes, a theatrical name. And she was a thespian. And she taught us from a very early age the craft of theater. And so I just wanna bring out and remember the names of my teachers who had this influence on me because I'll never forget them. Um, because these art teachers influenced my life greatly. I also credit my mother for realizing that I needed more than regular school. Uh, so Rose Lorenz was my dance teacher. 
from the time I was five to 18. And what she did was, besides being San Francisco ballet trained, she traveled the world. And so she brought dances back from Germany and Hawaii and India and the Philippines. And along with it, all the accoutrements that it took to make the dances. And she taught until she was 95. I tried to get her, her to Oregon to visit me, but she was too busy. And, um, but through her dance, she brought me the world. Yep, right there in Des Moines, Iowa. And Mrs. Brooks, she was a stitchery artist, was my fourth grade art teacher. And she recommended me for a scholarship to the Des Moines Art Center. So every single Saturday I attended from nine to noon. And that's where I met the Richardsons, a husband and wife team who recreated history and art and made it tangible and accessible and actually magical. John Phillips was my high school history and civics teacher who questioned all the time what we believed and created in me a love for fighting for truth and justice, for understanding the tenets of it. John Thompson was my high school drama teacher who cast me in parts before there was such a thing called blind casting. And he believed that if you were good, you should get the part. And if I told you the parts I played, well, one of them was a Puritan from Massachusetts in the Crucible. Um, he didn't care. He just thought if you were good, that's what you should do. So he told me once, I always knew you were one of them. So um, that was quite reinforcing for me. And then throughout the years, because of that foundation, I created numerous performances, solo works. Uh, and over the years, I've incorporated poetic text, movement, and share my personal journey of identity, culture, and community. So this picture was from a performance called Harmos. And this was my first community engagement piece created for Hiroshima Day. I think it was around 2007. And uh, my ongoing and long relationship that still exists with the Portland Physicians for Social Responsibility. So this was a citywide event. It was performed at three parks. Um, before that, we had um, attended street fairs and had peoples all over the city create peace flags and ask them, what does peace mean to you? And those flags you can kind of see in the background were then a backdrop and um, for our, our, our peace. But mostly what happened in this particular piece of working with a team of artists, we came up with what was our kind of mission statement. And this is a mission statement that I still use today in a lot of my work and writing. And it says, as you've read, it is our responsibility as artists to offer ways for people to express their creativity and humanity amidst a world of global wars, community divisiveness, rising, uh, um, excuse me, creativity, um, humanity amidst a world of global wars, community division, and rising human fear, creative expression, invention, and action are the cornerstones for a world of interconnectedness, global well-being, and personal fulfillment. So I had the opportunity of, um, oops, I guess I changed those slides. Um, this was a solo piece that I did years later. There we go, the kids, the, the kids one, um, thank you. So throughout my life, I've had the honor of teaching many children through my private studios, through schools and being a full-time arts um, specialist in public schools. And um, so it was during the Asian American identity movement and the redress movement 
that I continued to pursue my dance training, expressive arts training, and intergenerational work. I also trained in taiko, traditional Japanese dance, and poetry. So artists interfacing into schools are different from artists in the schools of teacher artists that are there full time. And as I stated, this was my experience of having teacher artists. So in education today, we're moving farther away from creativity in the classroom. Programs that bring art and artists into schools do exist and they are extremely important to support the work of arts in the schools, but many of our schools lack arts education. So this makes the role of museums like Portland Chinatown Museum even more important um, because we're asking questions now about who determines whose history is taught and what has been left out in teaching and telling the full story of America. And this is why we have to continue to work on systemic changes in all of our institutions. So this was my dance studio in um, Portland Public Schools. I don't know how many children I might have taught over the years. Um, these were extra classes after school, boys dance, um, contemporary dance. And um, I wanna ask you this question. So how did you learn to express yourself in school? I'm gonna play my little chime here and give you a moment to reflect on that. So after years in public education, I want to just list some things that became very apparent to me as um, challenges and things we need to look at um, when we are entering into public school education environments. So one of the things I noticed immediately was how time was divided and how time was used. And it really is um, the standardization of time that does not necessarily support a creative process. And so that means we have to look at how are we using time and can we develop creative scheduling? Um, and actually it's not that can we, we must develop creative scheduling to include uh, the arts and, and art, artful processes. If you're an artist going into the schools, or you're a teaching um, you know, artist going into the schools, or you're a speaker from the museum, a docent, uh, you immediately should find your allies in the school. And so sending out a note won't necessarily get you to who you need to get to. You need to find the two or three allies that are there in the school. And I am passionate, and I would like to ask you to be to support and design programs for children of color um, because they are lacking. And we need to always support and design those programs, but also focus on the stories and the histories that have been omitted. And um, also consider that the principles of art, the very tenets of art can be incorporated into any curriculum but the teacher must know what those are, not just kind of read it in a book, but having experienced them. So that's some of a few words on arts in education. So how can we teach history through storytelling and the performing arts? I wanna just share um, a few thoughts with you. So um, in my time at the school and working with um, students of color, I began to 
bring them together, particularly my school was K through five. I brought fourth and fifth graders together to talk about what it means to them, how they understand being a person of color, not only in their school, in their family, in their community. And so we began to organize with those fourth and fifth grade students and other teachers in the school um, events for assemblies for Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. These happened every year um, and uh, included many students over the years. They created the entire assembly. They did all of the, um, you know, the background work. They decided what they would would build, um, what they would talk about, what they would share with their families. And um, the students of color began to explore then also their own cultural heritages and their own stories. And it was during this time um, that I'd been, you know, in the schools as an artist, I really found that it was important for me to find support and find inspiration other places. And so I started to get involved in um, national programs that uh, that really appealed to me. And I began to work with Urban Bush Women and the Dance Exchange. And so it's through these connections that I was inspired to create curriculum, to hopefully inspire teachers and students to include histories um, that often weren't told. So I'm gonna just share a couple of those uh, with you. So um, I think you, did you skip one? So was there one right before, there we go. So this is a picture of a real second line uh, that I attended in New Orleans when I was part of Urban Bush Women. The story is a little bit long, but we were there and we couldn't miss this particular second line. And it lasted all day long uh, from 10 in the morning till five at night. And it was such a, a deeply moving experience for me, which included three bands, three um, you know, long groups of people, thousands of people. So when I came back um, from that experience, and was somewhat challenged in how to incorporate um, curriculum for students of color and for teachers. I decided the second line would be a wonderful experience. And so we did create our own second line. It was a year long curriculum. And um, I think that was the first slide that you showed, um, Capilani, that, that you saw the marching band and bunch of kids behind it. That was our school um, second line that included the year-long curriculum. Um, all of the grades learned a movement piece. We marched from the school all the way through Loan for a Cemetery. And um, there were school assemblies and training workshops for teachers that included um, culturally based history education. So um, that was a pretty exciting program. And I don't know, are you, are you stuck on the slides or, I'm, oops, we're not there yet, <laughs> almost. So um, that first slide that you showed though, that was our Buckman, that was our school second line. So you saw the musicians. And so the last one was in New Orleans, but another project, um, there you go. So that was all Portland people. That was our, our march down through the streets of Portland all the way to Lone Fir, all the way through Lone Fir. And we had done a unit on the, um, um, on the uh, Chinese American history and, and graves that were there at Lone Fir. And so um, we marched all the way through, worked with the Lone Fir Foundation and um, came back to the school. It was quite, an end of the year experience. One other project that I want to mention that I felt was um, really noteworthy was I worked with a second grade and this was a second grade team of teachers, three. And it actually was a three year 
project of starting from a unit about Japan to a full unit on Japanese American history in a partnership with the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, then the Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center. And it culminated in a performance, also the almost six month curriculum that was designed with teachers. And um, the original performance was called Gambate Be Strong. And this was about the Japanese American experience during World War II. And so this is a short video that talks about that work. Oops. I don't know if everybody else hears sound, but I don't hear sound. Do you want me to unmute you, Capulani? It might. I'm just restarting their community. Um, maybe you want to try starting it again? What's wonderful about this particular um, experience and this play is it really is well connected with the history of taiko and how the voice of the drum also became a voice of identity for many Japanese Americans. I really like the taiko. They can really use their body, they can use their voice in strong and rich ways, not um, as in just yelling or screaming, but finding a way to find that cooperation working together to create a very strong expression. It's a whole unit that they do around Portland and communities and families. And so it's a way for them to talk about their curriculum in that way, but through another lens, which really, I think, helps students learn about empathy and kindness. I thought, I think they must have felt really curious what's happening, a little bit sad to leave their house. They're at their age really mm. understand fairness. Mm -hmm. What's fair and what's not. You have to go! What? We didn't do anything. Um, I don't I don't really think it was good. Well, I think it's a good thing to remember that why the Japanese people were forced into internment camps because um the president owed them an apology, so they gave them an apology and they have to remember it so then it never happens again. Be strong! Here for the second. I had commented earlier that, um, there we are, we're second line in again, <laughs> um, that uh, this event happened right after the school performance. So we moved out all the chairs, we brought in the tables and we had parents with their children create tags based on the names of people who were actually held at the Portland Exposition Hall, which became known as the Portland Ex uh, Assembly Center, which is now, of course, the Expo Center, Hall A. And um, it was really an experience to create these tags to say that, um, and I, I may mention this again, but I was inspired by an African saying which is um, we all die two deaths. One, when our body is no longer here and two, when our name is no longer mentioned. And so we had copied all these names and proceeded to have parents and their children write these tags. So this is a little off the beaten track, but um, this is just a one photograph of a 
performance that I did with the Dance Exchange, uh, and I've been working with them for many, many years now, probably about 10 years now. Um, and uh, being involved with their process, which was inspired by the uh, iconic Liz Lerman in dance, um, I've learned how to um, really involve the creative process in all things that I do. And so this framework that I'm still learning was from a dance exchange. So this was a performance that involved community, the city, a statement um, to the city about a place. And um, uh, it took me to Washington DC, probably two or three times or more a year and all over the country, in fact, to, to work with and continue to work with Dance Exchange. So it's been a very strong influence in my work over the years. So another strong influence is my involvement with the, what we call the redress movement. And um, the kind of the iconic symbol that we used at that time is um, the symbol of three generations, which is it just my computer or are we not seeing the whole thing? There we go. Thank you. So this represents three generations um, wrapped in the barbed wire, first, second, and third generations. And now, of course, we're on the fourth and fifth generations. But um, it prompted this question for me in looking at at uh, my involvement during this time, that how have historical events shaped or affected your life? And this is one huge one for my life because I spent almost two decades working on redress. It sounds now like the redress movement happened and a bill passed and compensation was, but it was at least 17 years of, of working and spending hours in Old Town, which was then the Nikkei Jinkai Hall on 2nd and Cooch, um, that we navigated how and why we needed to be involved in bringing out this um, story and stories and history of the camp experience, of the concentration camp experience. Those years led up to the 1988 passage of the Civil Liberties Act. Uh, so I could go into all the minutia details of this, but this was also a period of time where three cases that went to the Supreme Court during 1942 were then brought up again in what was called the writ of quorum nobis. And Minori Yasui's case was reopened as a part of this effort, um, as well as Fred Korematsu from San Francisco and Gordon Hirabayashi from Seattle. So um, it was my years in the Asian American movement at that point that inspired um, me to take a step back from, from that involvement. And uh, I began to reflect on how can my activism as an artist because a lot of people didn't even know that I was an artist, um, come together. Uh, how can my activism and artful expressions merge? So these were also years I was busy teaching and raising a family, but I took this leave from my community work. And um, it wasn't until years later that uh, I emerged I did incorporate it in all the work that I was doing still, but moving back into community work, um, I was asked to participate in the campaign to award Minori Yasui a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, and at that time, posthumously, at that time I decided that if I was to return to a more deep, we involve community work, I would create um, a piece of art for that. And so that's when I began to um, develop what 
I've been called vision and vigilance because the whole point was to let people know who Minori Yasui was if they did not know. Uh, Minori Yasui was an Argonian, a civil rights hero. And this was a project that I directed and um, designed and it was funded by the Oregon Humanities. So what our tenant was is that one person's actions during times of uncertainty, of racism, systemic racism and bigotry um, are exemplified by immigration practices, racial profiling, a lack of due process and discrimination. Uh, and these are still unfortunately true today. So we need these heroes. We need new heroes to light our way. And the program included um, an excerpt from Min Minoru's daughter who wrote a play called Citizen Min about her father. So we crafted about a half an hour, 45 minute um, reader's theater piece and incorporated that into the events that were held in three cities in Portland, Hood River, Oregon and Ontario, Oregon. And the, the Reader's Theater or the dialogue was then to inspire community leaders from those areas to respond and to discuss and to lead what we call community roundtables. So we did the performances in all three cities. Um, we followed up with um, all of the uh, roundtables. And we found that these conversations were really catalysts and began to bring people together that wouldn't maybe otherwise be together. And it brought diverse communities together throughout Portland, so uh, throughout Oregon. And so there's a few pictures here about how those roundtables followed and how the um, readers theaters were um, piece of Citizen Men was produced. So we asked some essential questions during the design of this project. And they were, how do the actions of Minori Yasui during World War II affect the work you do today? And if you don't know, Minori Yasui in um, 1942 in the issuance of executive order also had another order, which was a curfew order which said that as of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. every night, anyone of Japanese American ancestry or Japanese ancestry had to be off the streets of Portland. So he intentionally violated that order. Um, so another question we explored was, how does the history and presence of racism and discrimination in Oregon impact our cultural landscape no matter what community you're from. And what are some actions, ideas that you as an individual or a community can take to affect change? So this was a group of actors, the, the former actors were from Portland. This was a group put together from Boise, Idaho and Ontario. And in that, uh, you know, we met local people and got to know local people and their stories in Ontario, Oregon, which is a whole story in itself. Um, so those round tables really um, brought people together. I think you might've seen those already, but anyway, in, in addition to Minori Yasui uh, and adding him to the pantheon of civil rights and American heroes, we worked with all people to address our past and our present and worked for the rights of all people to address the issues of today and talk about joint actions across ethnic lines. So even 30 years later, after his death, Yasui is the only Oregonian to be awarded the nation's highest honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And vision and vigilance benefited educators, students, 
community leaders, and diverse communities focused on defending civil rights and human rights. And it also created specific strategies to reach out to Asian American, African American, Native American, Arab American, Latinx, LGBTQ communities in order to intentionally diversify the participation and rich exchange. In other words, we curated our circles. So we need these new heroes, right, to light the way. And we asked many questions, as I had stated. But one was, what makes a hero? And you can find out more about the work of Minori Yasui uh, because the Japanese American Museum of Oregon houses the original cell in which he was um, spent nine months in solitary confinement. And every March 28th, which is the day that he violated the curfew order and he was arrested, has in the state of Oregon been um, titled Minori Yasui Day in perpetuity. So every March 28th is Min Minori Yasui Day. I want to go on and talk about a project that I called Remember Us. And Remember Us um, was created for the 75th memorial of the issuance of Executive Order 9066. And again, that quote from the African-American saying kept resonating in my mind that we die two deaths. So there was this book um, and those two deaths again are was when our body no longer exists. And the second is when no one mentions our name. So there is a big book in the museum that held all the names of the almost 4,000 people who were sent to the Portland Assembly Center. And um, everybody had to register which is an important point of the pyramid of, of racism, uh, which ends with you know, genocide. But this registration process was done by giving everyone a tag. And now they no longer had a name, they were given a number. And those tags had to been, be on everything that they owned, their luggage, their, their clothes, and it became and has be continued to be a symbol of Japanese American loss of freedom, loss of home, loss of property, and the devastating historic event that is part of Japanese American history. Um, so we enlarged these tags and we created another huge community engagement project uh, that was included in the event, the 75th uh, memorial of the executive order called Return and Remembrance. And it was held at the Expo Center. And so what we did is we had these envelopes and we sent them out to schools and community groups and churches. And people had to look at the names and the numbers and transfer those onto the larger tags. Then they also made a tag of themselves, of their family. So those are the colored tags that bookended the, the rope. Uh, the rope itself um, was supposed to be for this one day ritual event. Uh, it ended up being 35 feet long and it included all the names of the people who were held at the Portland Assembly Center. We alphabetized the entire rope because I was concerned that someone might say, so where is my name and where is my tag? And then we put all of the families together. So it was quite an educational experience for those who participated in the construction of the rope, which was many. Uh, we had work parties and the Japanese American community came together and, and other people that were interested um, from the schools. And so um, on the day of the event, we were to use this rope um, at the very end of the programming and it would be brought out ceremoniously 
in a ritual to honor those that were held. At the beginning of the event, we created a community cast. And these were community leaders, community members, uh, school children, children of you know, people that are standing here, along with the former poet laureate of Oregon, Lassen Inada, who wrote a poem for the day about what Nihon Machi was and then what the loss was and the impact of the executive order. So this was a community cast at the Return and Remembrance event. Um, and I just wanted to read just a little, no, I'm gonna re read that later, sorry. So um, we enacted in part the reading of the executive order when Lassen Inada read the whole order. Uh, we got our bags, we stood in line, and then we proceeded to walk through the audience of approximately 750 people who attended, many of which were former incarcerees. And so, um, at the very end of the program, we brought out the rope to taiko drumming. Um, it was quite an emotional event. It, it was probably a more emotional event leaving the stage and walking through the audience, knowing that there were um, people who were held at that particular spot. Um, because I knew that if I looked up, I probably was going to drop on my knees in, in emotional um, in emotion. Um, so we continued on. At the very end, uh, we did bring out that rope. This was uh, Lawson and I exiting at the very beginning. And these were some people who had been held at that assembly center. So after this event, I thought maybe we'll bury the rope or maybe we'll ceremoniously have a ritual burning of the rope or I really didn't know what was going to happen. But instead, what happened was people started to request um, it being displayed. And so the picture on the left, I believe, is uh, at a vigil that was held in 2017 at the Japanese American Historical Plaza in conjunction with an action that former incarcerees held in Fort Sill, Oklahoma on the same day at the same time to recognize the continued use and misuse of former incarceration sites. So this site at Fort Sill, Oklahoma was being used to house immigrant children. This was us processing through the audience and again, the community cast. We also um, used the rope in institutes and other performances. This was a, a conference at Lewis and Clark and um, the rope was displayed. Uh, and then again, for several months, uh, I think, or at least one month, the rope was on display. Here it is at the Linfield Multicultural Center. And so actually the rope continues on. Uh, the Remember Us, a rope of remembrance continues on. And it was last used in May, this last May, May 28th, 2022, and was displayed at the Expo Center for an event called Reseeding and Reclaiming Part of the Vanport Mosaic Festival. So I wanna talk a little bit about my work with Vanport and um, I'm gonna, oops, no, I'm gonna talk about uh, another, <laughs> I need to talk kind of fast here. Um, I think I might leave out the Vanport part, um, actually. 
or you can just show the slides really quickly while I'm while I'm talking about it. But this was a performance gambate, and again, the readings started. Um, the first one was, as you recall, in the second grade with the second grade class that I worked with, but it evolved into a full reading, and and it took three years to keep working on that reading because it involved interviews of community people, incorporating their stories into the writing until we um, focused in on the story of Japanese Americans who returned after their stay at Minidoka, they then came to Vanport. And so those families that entered into Vanport had lost their homes once in the executive order and then moved to Minidoka and the other 10 concentration camps lost their homes again and were re had to do everything again. And in Portland, um, I think there's about 300 people that return and the only place they could return to with $25 and a, and a bus ticket was Vanport. And so this story again um, was a story about the Japanese American experience in Portland from Nihon Machi all the way to Vanport. And we're hoping that this will show again at some point. Um, so the readings, you can just kind of go through those a little quicker there, um, dramatic as it was. Uh, and we are here with some people that we interviewed as a part of that script. And um, then in the 90 minute uh, theatrical piece in 2019, um, we created a community cast which involved 12 community members of Japanese American community who had never been on stage before, along with uh, professional actors. And this group right here that you see became a family in the process. And still to this day, if I call the Gambate community cast, they will come out and share life and share stories um, together. So I'm just going to have you go real quickly through the Vanport experience uh, because this was a project that was actually a three-year project that was funded in part by Civic Life and it was part of uh, Vanport Mosaic and Laura Laforti who is the called the story midwife of Vanport Mosaic project and um, myself who she deemed me the community weaver held three years of conversations, bringing the survivors of Vanport experience together with community people to talk about what were the lessons learned. Um, some of them were intentional and some of them of course were unintentional, but had a historic impact on all of the people that were involved in Vanport and thereafter. You can see that we involved artists in this project and that I was very, uh, excited to infuse once again artful practices in this um, throughout the three years Alex Chu who has created many murals um, for the Chinatown Museum and in, in uh, historic Chinatown his work was there he was drawing with uh, assistance while we were talking while we were having these conversations we had a poet on board who was listening to what people were saying and then would come back and create and share the poetry that he had um, created from listening to people's, not only in larger circles, but smaller community circles. And so I think I wanna just continue to um, go on. And this is Ken Yoshikawa, who is a poet. And the one thing that I really appreciated in this process was my ability to incorporate movement and silence and different approaches to how people gather, not just to talk, not just to chat, but a process that infused artful um, techniques to how we then experience the humanity of each other to help us ask questions. And to bring us together. can see Alex's beautiful work here. 
as a part of Vanport Mosaic. These are on display at the Alberta House um, now. And I'm gonna briefly talk about Old Town, historic Old Town, Chinatown, Japantown, because that's where a lot of my work is happening today as the creative director of the Living Arts Program. Um, I wanna just show this quick video called Remember. If you don't know, why don't you know? There should be no reason why people don't know. It's all our story now, but if it's forgotten, then will it be gone? Will we be an artifact that will later be discovered, but the narrative will be gone? You can call them internment camps, concentration camps, whatever you want to name them, but they were in fact prison camps. And it was a violation of every American right that is the foundation of our constitution. We think of Old Town, we think of Chinatown, but prior to that was a thriving Japanese town, Japantown. I'm Jean Matsumoto. Our family lived on um, 69 Southwest Pine Street. All my friends lived in this neighborhood. This whole neighborhood by the 1920s, 1930s, almost every building that's white had Japanese families. And they had laundries and restaurants and uh, hotels. Things were going pretty good in town, and then everything fell apart on December 7th. People were taken to the, what then was the Portland Exhibition Hall, now known as the Expo Center. That's where animals were kept and the animals were moved out and the stalls were built. May 6th was when we were started being herded into the assembly center. It's amazing how soon you could get used to the smell of manure. We were all under one roof. I don't know how they crammed 3,000 of us in there. We could only take what we could carry, which wasn't very much. We lose a lot of uh, lives uh, when families lost everything. It's always amazing to me how many people don't know that that happened. It's not only a loss, but it's like a memory been wiped away, forgotten. And there were a few businesses after the war, not nearly the 300 that existed prior to. That's not just my history. That's Portland's history. That's Oregon's history. That's all of our history as citizens of the state. We are inextricably linked as Japanese Americans, but as American citizens to that history, that identity and that rooting and who we are and where we came from and what our personal histories are is what anchors us. When you have a government that's saying, 
oh, we could maybe reuse those internment camps that Japanese Americans were held in. It does question our knowledge of what America is. So Kapiolani and Anna, I'm going to end here. I know I was going to talk more about my work, but I think we're we're at time. <laughs> so um, I, I mean, I actually have a few minutes if you wanted to uh, maybe talk about five minutes more, or you can end it now. It's up to you. Okay. Well, this is um, the flyer here. You see is the development of the Living Arts Program. Um, and we're focused on three areas of interest to, um, uh, to, to the program now. And that's on what we call Inaka, which is the Japanese term for land or farmland. So looking at and tracing the history and the contributions of Japanese American farmers to Oregon, they were, they were, the, the loss was great um, with the farming, in fact, about 60 to 70% of all the fruits and vegetables in Oregon prior to World War II were provided um, by Japanese American farmers. So Inaka, um, Back to the Land is part of our program. The other one uh, is the work that I continue with the intergenerational work. And that is, um, I'm doing movement classes uh, at our Koinokai or the Epworth uh, Methodist Church for all ages. Um, we're protecting, uh, of course, our Japanese American Historical Plaza. We have a lot of work to do in Old Town. Um, and uh, I want to invite everybody because during this pandemic, we actually built a brand new museum. We were known as the Oregon Nikkei Legacy Center, and now we are the Japanese American Museum of Oregon. Um, it's on the corner of Fourth and Flanders. And so you can go on our website. You can look at the information. And I, I want to end with just one short poem that was part of Gambate and American Legacy. So I have these roots deep in my veins, these places with combination locks that wrap and love and arise out of somewhere from places I forgot, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. Thank you so much, Portland Chinatown Museum for this opportunity to talk to everyone today. Thank you so much, Shishao. Thank you so much. It was really, really beautiful. And I realized I forgot to mention at the beginning of the um, webinar that folks are welcome to add questions in the Q&A. We have some questions already, but um, Giselle, that was so powerful. I actually smelled the finger paints when you started <laughs> and that palpable connection to what you were talking about continued throughout. It was uh, really um, just kind of a profound experience. So thank you. Um, and Papiolani, is it okay if I kick it off with the first question? Yes, please. Okay, great. So, and, and this kind of connects to actually what we were talking about before um, oh. got started today. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can now. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first question is, what sustains you personally as an artist, especially uh, when working with themes or topics that might be challenging, painful, or complicated? So I guess I didn't really think about that question that as deeply maybe as I could, because I feel so compelled to tell the history. I feel a responsibility. So it, 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 it's, it doesn't feel like a burden. It feels more like a gift that I'm in this position to be able to share it, to have the knowledge that my parents and my grandparents have passed on to me. So it, it's, it's part of the legacy that I'm hoping that I can leave to my, my 
children and grandchildren, I have to say that, you know, as I progress, I'm making sure that I take care of myself um, by getting plenty of rest, eating good food, taking those walks, and knowing what's what are the priorities, right? Some people get taken away by the by the work, but our lives are the most important part so that we can offer those gifts. Yeah, you have to be healthy to be able to, you know, kind of uh, sustain this work. Thank you so much. Can you share a memory or impression from a performance or creative experience that particularly resonated with you? Something that really sort of struck you and um, you've carried into your future work? Oh boy. Um, there's been so many, but I think this is one magical thing about theater, right? You get to explore your own issues, um, your own terrain, your own personal terrain. And there was several years because I never knew my grandparents. My grandparents were, were gone before I was born, except for one, my grandfather, and he was in Hood River and I was in Iowa. And so I only met him twice. So I had to learn how to do um, what I call my, my ancestor work without them. Um, it wasn't necessarily reading, it was really going inside and trying to access um, who they were as a part of who I am and be kind of open to that, um, to that vehicle that's, that's there for all of us and recognize that, um, they're they're with me like I think about thousands of people on my back right or lifting me up <laughs> so I, it's not one particular moment although if I thought hard enough I could probably find one but I think uh yeah that discovery that personal discovery um is mainly it for me Thank you. I think a lot of people share that experience of not knowing uh, their grandparents or great grandparents or not knowing that history, um, but you can still tap into it and try and find and make those connections. Yes. Well, and also, also helping other people make those connections, right? Like the, um, the rope project that expanded into the folks that reclaimed the names and assisted in that uh, uh, preservation um, was so beautiful. We're going to kind of shift gears a little, and I, I'm seeing there are a number of uh, questions, comments in the chat, so I won't I won't miss those or skip those. Um, but I wanted to ask this next question just because it pertains to our current circumstances in um, Old Town, New Chinatown, and Japantown. Um, the pandemic impacted the museum world greatly. Many even closed down. Um, you opened a beautiful new space. If you haven't been to JAMO, you owe it to yourself to go. It's just gorgeous, um, you know, during the pandemic. What are some of the new challenges and where do you see potential and possibility for small museums like PCM and JAMO, um, you know, now and in the future? Well, first of all, I want to acknowledge that we are in a challenging environment in historic Old Town the news and the city's response does not help us at all. Um, I would like to believe that, you know, this historic area is important and vital to our city to preserve and that we need to find the ways to do that. If that doesn't happen through our leadership, it's going to happen through our cultural organizations. And as we work together, I think even more than ever before, you know, we'll, we'll look at how we can, can support each other, maybe connect our programming, even connect our stories um, is, is going to be very important. But it's going to take people in Portland saying these spaces are vital to our city. Um, and we're going to need everybody to stand up and not say, I'm not going to Old Town because of what's happening. You know, it's it we want you to come to our museums. We exist, we're here. Um, you can call us. We've provided like this numeral virtual 
um, experiences. So you can kind of dip your toe in and come in gradually. And if there is apprehension, we have ways to help you enter. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it's, uh, you know, something that's on the forefront of our minds. And you said it so well, just how that if, you know, if the folks we would expect would be um, mitigating and remedying the circumstances don't, that's we uh, trying to figure that out. Um, You're so glad be we have partners. Creative. We're going to be so creative and the artists that I'm working with and the artists that you're bringing in, the, the ideas that are being generated, the, 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 the level of creativity that's going to come out is our way in <laughs> to reimagining. I mean, that's the third part of, of the, the Living Arts Program is remembering and reimagining Nihon Machi, but also the broader historic uh, old town. And there are going to be events and, and things that are gonna happen here that people must come to. When we had a free day at the museums, we saw people come down, yeah. right? We had high numbers and it's gotta be consistent. So we see the city saying, oh, well, more people are coming back to downtown on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but, um, you know, just watch for the events that we're going to be having and the pop-ups and the artist, uh, you know, creativity will be abounding and that will be a way to bring people back. Yeah, I think it is really one of the most um, productive and effective avenues um, to preventing that demolition by neglect, but you just inspired me. <laughs> and food, always remember food. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a quick question, and I think you spoke to it with some of the questions and prompts that you offered the audience to think about as you were sharing your uh, work and experience. Um, as a longtime arts educator, do you have a favorite prompt or activity that anyone can do that can help them sort of tap into their creative, artistic, um, expressive side? Oh, yeah, I have a poem. I don't know if it'll take too long. No, please go ahead, we'd love to hear it. Okay, play. In mud making mud pies with fancy toppings of grass and stones and sell them for real. <laughs> play with dolls under the dining room table, move out the rug and move out the furniture and play and make and play, making architectural houses out of leaves play teacher, one who reads, plans, dances, and serves cookies, and play doctor with the tools of the trade for real. Benefits of having a nurse for mom. Play how to heal, have your patients draw. Without judgment, it's all beauty, but get the facts straight there are rules. The art is art, always reaching for more ways to love. Listen, listen to music and sing, learn to play music, whisper, dance and listen, listen and dance and more with others who love and make with others who love, even if they don't love in the same way, learn to listen to them too, without judgment. The art is art, always reaching for more ways to love. Look, look carefully through your nose, through your hands, through your breath, look. Your eyes are only one vessel. Feel your body sweat. Feel your body, your heart, your breath into it. Connect with ancestors. Feel what is the right thing to do. Without judgment, the art is art. Always reaching for more, for more. Do all the above 
do all the above. Make and play and listen and move and look, observe and remember and hold and flow quietly and loudly, not in an either or kind of way, but both and. Thank you, that poem was a gift. <laughs> I think Anna has one last question before we take um, the ones that were posted in our Q&A. Yeah, and um, really some wonderful comments too, just um, people very generous for your entire presentation. And that last poem was truly a gift. And so this speaks to a bit of what, um, you know, you started to talk about at the end of the presentation and a bit about what we've, you know, been touching on in the Q&A. And that is, what are some future projects that you're excited about that we can put on our calendars too? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have a new uh, exhibit opening at the at the museum October fourth, no October second, called Resilience, uh, Sanse, a Sanse story, but it's highlighting many uh, third generation artists and our experiences, and we're uh, bringing in a wonderful artist Tom Nakashima whose work is part of the show. And he will be doing an artist talk on October 2nd at 2 p.m. at the U of O building. So we hope to have a lot of people come there and, and share his talents and his knowledge and um, his gifts as an artist. So that's one thing that that show will go on through, I believe, December. In January, we're going to have quite a few events at the museum focused on the living arts. Uh, and Inaka and other things that we can offer. Right now we're supporting the current exhibits through artful ways that we can think of. Um, but as far as events, um, one of the things that we're doing internally first is um, our board and staff and docents are all viewing a film called Children in the Camps. And while it's an old film, it's really um, an essential story to the Japanese American experience. I'm, I'm hoping that we will also offer that viewing um, at our museum during the time of the resilience exhibit as well. And maybe this show too, <laughs> maybe this video as well, since you recorded it. Thank you so much. Yes, we would love that. Kapilani, do you wanna go through the questions or do you want me to? Um. We have a question from Roberta Wong, who is interested in your uh, vision um, as the creative director of Living Arts at JAMO. So um, the overall vision right now, which is what I was talking about, includes looking at the history and the legacy of Japanese American farms in Oregon um, from now and looking back, and also Nihon Machi. So the stories and the history and the legacy of what not just what was, but how we can look forward and reimagine a new historic old town. And right now we are, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon on 4th and Flanders is the only remains of Japantown. So we don't have restaurants, we don't have um, you know, businesses, we don't have community centers. So we're hoping that we can engage with um, other communities who are in Old Town to look at what do we all need and what can we, how can we revitalize this area? I know Roberta um, has a wonderful idea to rename Fourth Avenue and give it a different name. I think there are ways that we can begin the reclaiming um, and lift up the history at the same time. That may not be enough for you, Roberta, but that's what I got right now. <laughs> it's evolving and it will be great and it will involve artists for sure. Um, Roberta you. also wrote excellent presentation and much appreciation for your work slash play. Thank um, you, my dear friend. Uh, Cassandra Schulte, uh, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, is there a way to watch the video again, if it's online. That's a you uh, question. 
Oh, the videos I showed? Yeah, remember uh, the last video that uh, featured? Um, yeah, it's a part of the story arc okay. project, but if they email you or you can certainly share that link. Um, it's- Will do. Yeah, it was part I'll of the include. University of Oregon media project. So it's, it's out there in the world and it actually won, I didn't even know we were competing, but it was selected to be I think this was a couple of years ago, part of the short film festival that mm -hmm. Hollywood Theater created. And it was shown at the um, airport Hollywood Theater for about six months. So it's a, it's a, had its, had its use for sure. There's Great. also the poem that I read is part of another talk, talk that I get, gave at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, Portland Art Museum has artist talks, so it's, I, I believe it's on YouTube, that artist talk and, and the last poem. Yeah, I'll include those links in the follow-up email. Um, Anna, do you want to uh, take some of the others in Q&A? Certainly. Um, we have a lot of um, uh, contemporary artists and, and poets here with us. One of them is one of our resident artists, Sam Rojas Chua writes, thank you for you inc your inclusivity of all cultures and stories as part of one big Oregon historical fabric. And that also connects with the, your title at Vanport, uh, the weaver. Is it just how the community weaver you said? <laughs> yeah. Yes, <laughs> so very in line with that. Um, and I call then, it a dot connector. <laughs> dot connector, that's good too. <laughs> And then we have more thanks, uh, like uh, Rosalie Pedrosa says, thank you for your presentation. Can't wait to learn more. Lots of just positive um, and, uh, positive comments and gratitude for your, for your presentation and your very important work um, you know, for our community in, in Oregon and really the, you know, the country. Um, so lots of people are very grateful. Um, and then I think, I think I want to just wrap up and mention that, you know, just how you, you kind of hooked us early with these questions that gave us a palpable connection to, you know, the way in which art teaches history and, and activates, you know, an awareness and empathy for, you know, a way to kind of preserve, prevent that second death you talked about that was so powerful, and also to kind of reform as something that we're all involved with in Old Town. And I uh, couldn't help but think of, I've been reading the whole picture by Alice Proctor that looks at colonialism in museums, and your approach is, is like a remedy to this. Um, and she says that the best kind of museums that are working in the vein of memorial create a landscape of memory that create this common ground and empathy. And I felt like your the project with the tags and the rope was was exactly that. And you know, I, I felt like um, what I was sensing with it that you know feeling of like almost it was an odd feeling of almost knowing that you know experience. I was seeing that in the photos, the documentary photos of the folks that were participating. And then I wanted to just mention one more thing, which is another thing that Proctor talks about that museums can do to combat, you know, the erasure of these narratives is to preserve them in the way your projects have. And one of the important elements is to pull apart the consequences of the past. This is her quote. I'm sorry, I should be <laughs> quoting her where I'm <laughs> quoting her. Um, but uh, to pull apart the consequences of the past to create sites of conscience, which we can use to educate and generate change. And I just, the whole time you were talking, I was thinking about these passages in the book because the examples that Proctor gives are don't come close to what you've done with, with your projects. Really beautiful and powerful work. Thank so you. Had, we had have to, to create, you know, we went through this whole period of questioning what our national monuments are, but that also means that we have to create living monuments. We have to create new monuments. And I'm involved in a project right now um, that's funded through the Mellon Foundation that is bringing together 75 assembly centers, concentration camps, DOJ camps um, with a soil sample uh, 
from all of these places to be ritualized in a processional event at the Japanese American Museum, the National Japanese American Museum, Japanese American National Museum in Los Angeles uh, toward the end of September. And I'm so thankful to uh, Duncan Williams who is leading up that project. You can see that it was uh, four, four um, monument projects that were, were uh, funded by the Mellon Foundation. So if you look on that site, it's a it's a very exciting um, project to bring people together, create something that's lasting, acknowledge the history as we're doing this, and build community as as we're coming together. So there are going to be people there that this is maybe their last journey as a survivor of the concentration camps coming to Los Angeles. They're in their late 80s, mid 90s, some of them, which I believe that our elders survive in spite of what was done to them, you know. Yeah, it's a triumph. Um, it, yes, it's it's a it's a resilience and and a history and and a lesson for all of us when we get discouraged or when we think we have it hard. Um, I think about my parents who were in the concentration camp for three years, and we've been in a pandemic for three years, but I could go to the store, and I didn't lose my home, and I still had my children, you know, I still had a car, <laughs> I, the, it, it really helped me empathize even more with their um, choices, their limited choices in how they survived during that three years um, in what we've gone through. So I think that that we have to really teach each other and our children not to be tick, TikTok stars, but to be empathetic human beings. Yeah, such a beautiful note to, to end on, end our conversation on. Um, and I, we will look up that event in LA as well and hope and put that in our newsletter to make sure people know about it. Um, and so I want to just thank you again, Chisal, for joining us. Uh, you are a wonderful kind of final installation for this artist talk series. And I want to thank all of the attendees, uh, the artists and community members that are here in the audience. Um, thank you for joining us as we celebrate and learn more about our Asian American artists working in the intersections of community, history, and culture. And a, a special note, you know, um, so much gratitude to Chisau and all of the artists who participated in the series. It really was an incredible series. Um, and also I wanna give a special thanks to Capiolani, our uh, manager of online programming and community engagement. Uh, Capiolani was really the heart, at the heart of this program. Uh, and, you know, really from the very beginning poured everything into it that made it a lot of what it was, so. Thank you, Kapiolani. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. A round of applause. Um, and then if you would like to revisit today's talk or the entire series, um, there's a recording and transcript that will be made available on our website next week. So you can check back for this, this final installment. And we're going to put um, the website address for JAMO, uh, the Japanese American Museum of Oregon in our um, in our literature as well. And it sounds like Capulani is also gonna include some of the links to these wonderful projects. I apologize if my sound is funny a bit. You can email me, if you email chisao at jamo.org, I, I will get an email. Okay, that's wonderful too. And I think we can put that in the chat for folks who wanna, oh, so quick, Sarah, thank you. <laughs> Um, and just we'd like for you to um, follow Chisau's work and the amazing exhibitions that uh, JAMA uh, will be presenting in the coming months. Before we go, I just want to let all of you know that we do have some exciting programming coming up in the, in the neighborhood, in the community, in the museum. We will have our last weekend with Carrie Wong's beautiful show, The World Transformed, um, on uh, September 10th, which will also be one of our celebrations for Autumn Moon. There will be a night market the weekend before that at Lansu Chinese Garden. We have an exhibition for our residents, our resident artists coming up in November that is 
sure to uh, wow and awe. We're very much looking forward to that. And a series of retrospective exhibitions um, that we will be uh, mounting with the assistance of the very talented artist and curator, Roberta Wong. So please watch our website for these upcoming events as well, and make sure to uh, watch um, JAMO's website as well. Come out and support our institutions in our work. Um, so uh, it was wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Have a great weekend. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. Yay. <laughs> Round of applause. Yay. Did they all sign up? <laughs> um, we still have, we, we have 11. It's going down. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful job, Chiselle. And oh, I, thank you. I hope it made sense because I'm like, I went.